Hello, and welcome to part one of Shakespeare Speaking the Speech. I'm Eleanor, and throughout this series, we're going to look at a series of Shakespearean monologues, and I'll be teaching you simple acting techniques for how to perform them. Now, normally when you study Shakespeare in school, you're looking at the text from a literary critique point of view. But as we all know, Shakespeare's words were not meant to be read, they were meant to be spoken. So let's get started. First, we're going to start with a series of movements meant to loosen up your body. Then we're going to work on some breath control. Lastly, we'll do some vocal warm-ups. Then we'll be ready to get started. Next, we're going to look at the text. We'll analyze what the written word is, look for opportunities for performance. Then we'll perform the text. So let's start with our body warm-up. Now, as you can see, I'm wearing my comfy clothes. I have my bottle of water handy. What we want to do when we're working our body here is we're going to lengthen and loosen. So we're going to start with my arms, stretch like this. Make sure we're lengthening this part of our body. Then we're going to go the other side. Now, if you're involved in sports, like if you do basketball or you do running, a lot of the warm-ups you do for your athletics are awesome to do before you perform. I'm going to go up like this. Remember, we're working on lengthening the spine, so anytime you stretch, you want to make sure that you're pointing your tailbone down to the floor. And remember, make sure all your movements are controlled. If it hurts, don't do it. So. Let's focus on our spine now, because remember, a lot of what we're doing is opening up our lung capacity. So your spine starts from the bottom here, your tailbone, and then goes all the way up to the back of your skull, back here. So when we're talking about stretching and lengthening our spine, we're going to isolate each vertebrae at a time. So I've got my feet shoulder width apart. My shoulders are straight, level with my body. And we'll start with the top vertebrae. Tilt down there, and then we'll do the other neck vertebrae. Now let's hold here. You notice my shoulders are in the same position they were before. My back is in the same position it was before. All we've done is isolate the vertebrae in the neck. Now let's keep going down. Okay, now we've got about to here. I'm using my stomach muscles here to keep myself straight. Remember, you don't want to let gravity take over. You can with your arms, but we're controlling our spine. And we're going one vertebrae at a time, going all the way down. You should feel your muscles lengthening. We're going all the way down to the floor. And once we get to our tailbone, remember, we want to keep our legs in a standing position. And now we can let gravity take over. Keep helping lengthen us. See how now my fingers can brush the floor? When you're here, you can actually sway from side to side. This is actually really great. You can do this every morning. If you feel like you slept wrong or you feel tight, this actually feels really great. Make sure that you're bobbing your head so that you know you're letting control go of your head. All right, now we're going to come back up. So again, isolate one vertebrae at a time. We're going to start with our tailbone. And here we come. We're stacking one vertebrae at a time. I see how all this is still loose. Stack up, up, up. We're going to let our shoulders come back. Remember, my head is still fully flopped. And then stack my one vertebrae at a time. And I'm back. It's as easy as that. Now, when you're in that position, you can also go all the way up and all the way down a little quicker. So now that we've done it, we can go down. We're back down here. Bounce, bounce, bounce. We can come up like that very easily. Now, we're going to stand like this. We're going to take our right foot. We're going to kind of put it in front of our left. We're going to try to keep them straight with our shoulders. And then we're going to tilt the right foot out a little bit. Okay? Then we'll go down, flop, flop, flop. Align yourself now when you're over your knee. Use your arms as a guide, and they'll actually come up like that. Now remember, 
From here, we're actually kind of using our tailbone as a hinge. And down. And up. Let's try the other side. Feet, shoulder width apart. Left leg forward. Tilt it a little bit. Let's come up. And then we can start from up. Remember, keep your knees bent and loose. Like that. Now, do I sound a little different? Do I sound like I have more control over my breath? That's because I've loosened all this up. I'm getting more oxygen into my lungs. My lungs are filling. And in turn, my voice is filling the space. <sighs> so now, let's get our breath under control. Because remember, it's not just enough to be loose. We have to be able to use this instrument that we have. <sighs> a great way to control our breath is by using a marker. And that can be your hand. So I'm going to turn the side a little bit so you can see what I'm doing. Remember, straighten and lengthen, keep everything stacked on each other. Let's take our hand to about here. And let's take a nice deep breath in. Remember when we're breathing, we're not going to breathe from our chest. <gasps> nope, that's not, we're not going to get very far there. You want to breathe from our tummy. You want to make sure your tummy's nice and loose. You can actually put your hand on it and feel. You should feel all of this loosening up. A lot of times in our daily lives, we walk around with our stomachs very tight, like armor. You know, nobody can hurt me. <sighs> you just got to let it all go for this one. All right. So we're going to breathe in. Try to breathe in through your nose if you can. And then we're going to let out our breath in a steady stream on our hand. Now, as you breathe out, you should actually feel your stomach muscles tightening again because they're helping us compress that last bit of air that's in our lungs. So remember, let them loose when you breathe in, tighten them up as you breathe out. That's the essence of control. So let's try it again. Have our hand about here and put the other hand on your tummy so you can actually feel this happening. Breathe in. Did you feel the breath on your palm the whole time? You should. Now we move out our arm a little more. Breathe in. Like that. As you go, you can keep moving your hand out further. And if you really want to try to get that pinpoint accuracy, use a single finger, like blowing out a candle. And then move it all the way out to the length of your arm. Now that we've got our breath working with us, our bodies working with us, let's work on our mouth. There's a great little tongue twister that a lot of people, especially Shakespearean actors, like to use because it's a Shakespeare quote. The sixth age shifts. Can you say that? Take all the time you need with it. The sixth age shifts shifts. The sixth age shifts. Just repeat after me. We're going to do it over and over. We're going to speed up a little bit. The sixth age shifts. 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 Remember, the faster you do it, you want to make sure you're getting all of that diction in there. That's what's working out your lips, your tongue, and your teeth. And speaking of the lips, the tongue, and the teeth, there's another tongue twister I like a lot. So, this one, we're going to stand very tall, very straight. This is a grand one. You're going to repeat after me. Lolita. The tip of the tongue. The lips and the teeth. Take a trip of three steps down the palate and to the teeth, tapping on the count of three, Lolita. That's how you do it. So now that our 
mouth is warmed up, there's lots of other great things that you could do. Trills are really great. Actually, especially when you're, war war you're warming up, trills can be really good. You just go. See how I'm going through my whole vocal range? You go up to as high as you can. Looks kind of funny, doesn't it? But it works. Next, we're going to go over our text analysis since we're all warmed up. So let's grab our Sonnet 18 handout, a pencil, and our water. Remember, we always want to keep hydrated when we're acting. Now that we've done all our warm-ups, let's move on to text analysis. You're going to need your Sonnet 18 handout and a pencil. So first, let's look at how Shakespeare presents the text to us. So Sonnet 18 is, as you may have guessed, a sonnet. Now what is a sonnet? Well, a sonnet is a type of poem that's composed of three quatrains and a rhyming couplet, totaling 14 lines. English was very important to the English around this time. There was a certain magic in how people spoke. You ever notice how in Harry Potter you can't just wave your wand around, you have to speak the spell? Well, it all comes back to this idea. So, if you wanted to convey an idea of perfection and beauty, the way that you lay out your speech directly affects that idea. So let's take a look at our sonnet. Now we've broken it up for you here into metrical feet called iams, which has de-stress on the first syllable and stress on the second syllable. Da-da, I am. Now each line is blocked out into five I ams. Two, three, four, five. So if we have five I ams in a line, we call that iambic pentameter. Iambic, meaning that's the metrical feet we're using, and pentameter, there's five. You always want to go through with Shakespeare's speech and find where the stresses are. Because like I said, how this text is laid out directly reflects the state of who's speaking. So for a sonnet and a love poem at that, we want everything to be perfect. So if we go through the entire text, we're going to see perfect I am's the whole way through. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May. And summer's lease hath all too short a date. There you go. And that is a quatrain. So you see the rhyme scheme is A, B, A, B. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate, B. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, A. And summer's lease hath all too short a date, B. So on the side, we can write A, B, A, B. And now we move on to our second quatrain. Sometime too hot, the eye of heaven shines, C. And often is his gold complexion dimmed, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's change course untrimmed. D. Quatrain number two. So you can see too that the ideas of each quatrain are contained in each one. When we move on from sort of one idea to another, we're changing which quatrain we're in. But thy eter nilsa mershal not fade, 
e, nor lose, possess, shen of, that fair, thou ost, f, nor shall, death brag, thou want, drist in, his shade, e, when in, eater, no lines, to time, thou grossed, f. And now we have our rhyming couplet to top everything out. Now you can see in this text that this rhyming couplet kind of wraps up the entire idea of what we're talking about. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. Those are both G because they rhyme. And there you have it. That is your notated sonnet. Now we do this so that, again, we can go through and find if there are any anomalies, any times when there's extra beats or we're breaking rhyme or things are really difficult to say. Remember our warm up, the sixth age shifts? Now that's part of a monologue where we're talking about the seven ages of man. The character is describing each step along the way as we grow old. So we're leading up with ages one through five, growing, getting better, but then the sixth age shifts. And from then on, we decline. It's a way that Shakespeare wrote the text so that the actor knows this is a time to pause, to really think about what we're saying. Now, since this poem is a love poem and it's intended to be very beautiful, we don't have to worry about any of that. Everything rolls trippingly off the tongue. And also, an added benefit of iambic pentameter in general is that it's easier to remember. You ever notice how it's easier to remember the lyrics to a song than it is the passage to a book? Well, that's why. Our brains are hardwired to remember rhyming things, poems, songs, things with a beat. Very rarely was this sort of thing written down in Shakespeare's day. In fact, the only reason we have so much of what he's written is because other people decided to write it down after his death. People who acted in his plays, people who received his sonnets. They all wrote it down, condensed it together, and that text has survived to this day so that we can enjoy it. So when Shakespeare writes in iambic pentameter, it's not to be fancy, it's not to show off, it's actually to help his actors remember what they were supposed to be saying when they get up there on stage. So now let's take a look at the text. Now we don't have to do any big literary analysis. We'll save that for school. As an actor, what we want to do is make sure that we're finding certain things in the text so that when we perform them, it comes out and it feels true. We're conveying something to our audience. Acting is a relationship between the actor and the audience, and the bridge is our text. So let's take a look. Now, I've deliberately chosen Sonnet 18. It's very straightforward, but it's a lot of fun. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Now, who do you think we're talking to? Obviously, this person is going to be somebody who we care about. Probably a boyfriend, a girlfriend, a husband, a wife. But it can also be somebody who we just genuinely love, like a parent. Somebody that we really care about. Somebody that we believe is lovelier than a summer's day. So you see, thou art more lovely, more beautiful. You know how much, how great summer is, how nice it is to go outside. Somebody's better than that, that's pretty great. And more temperate, which is kind of a joke because as we can see, the next lines, rough winds do shake the darling buds of May and summer's lease hath all too short a date. So even in summertime, things aren't perfect. It can get stormy, it can get windy, it can get way too hot to even go outside. All of these things make summer less great than the person who's the subject of this poem. So that's something when you're performing, you're going to want to play with to get that point across. You're comparing one thing versus another. Uh, Sometimes you hot the eye of heaven shines and often is his gold complexion dimmed. Clouds, of course. Uh, and every fair from fair sometime declines by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. So everything that's alive eventually fades. Circle of life, we all know that. So what Shakespeare is positing is the idea that anything that's alive will eventually lose its beauty, lose its luster. 
which is a pretty sad thing to think about. Now we've got a but, but thy eternal summer shall not fade. So now we're, pos we're positing this new idea. So we're saying you're better than summer, summer's not that great, here's the way it's not great, and just in general, everything kind of turns to winter time, goes to hibernate, you know, dies, all that stuff. But your summer, your greatness is eternal. Now why is that? Uh, you nor lose possession of the fair thou owest, nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, again the idea of being eternal, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. Now eternal lines means the lines of a poem. So, so long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. So the idea is that Shakespeare's going one step further. He's not just saying that, you know, you're better than summer because you're brighter, you're sweeter, you have a better temper than summertime does, but I am going to immortalize you in my text, in my performance, so that you will live on forever which is a pretty great thing for a writer to say. Our time here is fleeting, but the things that we do echo throughout time. And it's really fortunate too that Shakespeare's works were able to be preserved, were able to be enjoyed, were able to go on forever because there are a lot of writers whose works we'll never know, whose plays we'll never get to experience again just because they were written down and saved. So now that we've gone through our text analysis, we have an idea of who our subject is. Now we want to think about the action that we want to do. Acting is all about playable action, as you can probably guess from what it's actually called. Acting. We're acting upon another person. Now, uh, Patsy Rodenberg has a great idea of acting called the circles of presence. The idea that when we're acting, we're actually interacting with different circles. Your first circle would be yourself. When you're having an internal conflict or you're posing two different questions, it's all inside, your internal monologue. A lot of times when you hear a voiceover in a movie, that's the first circle. It's someone talking to themselves. The second circle of presence is everybody around you, talking one-on-one -on -one with people or to a group. Now, this is what we're going to encounter most often when we do acting, because of course there are other people on stage or we're addressing a group of people. We're working through that second circle. The third circle is what I like to call entreating the heavens. It's where we're looking out to the outside force, whether it's nature or fate or time or God, something that is bigger than a human, something that may not necessarily be something that you can look at one-on-one -on -one and really interact with. It's more of an entreaty, a plea. So thinking about the circles of presence, where do we think Sonnet 18 falls? The second circle, that's right, because we're talking to a single person. So remember when you're acting to include that person, to be a part of that circle with them. Now, what action are we going to do on that particular person? Well, why would you write and perform a love poem for somebody? Maybe it's because you're confessing. Maybe you've never told them that you love them before and you're going to lay it all out there. Maybe you want to cheer them up. They're sad, they're depressed, they don't think very much of themselves right now and you want to pull them up, you want to pull them out of their shell and remind them how wonderful they are through what you're saying to them. So once you've chosen your playable action and your subject, you're ready to start performing. Now we're gonna to go to my performance so you can get one idea of how you might perform the text. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Rough winds do shake the darling buds of May, and summer's leaves hath all too short a date. Sometime too hot the eye of heaven shines, and often is his gold complexion dimmed. And every fair from fair sometime declines, by chance or nature's changing course untrimmed. But thy eternal summer shall not fade.
nor lose possession of that fair thou owest. Nor shall death brag thou wanderest in his shade, when in eternal lines to time thou growest. So long as men can breathe or eyes can see, so long lives this, and this gives life to thee. Thank you for joining us for part one of Shakespeare Speaking the Speech. Remember to work on this sonnet this week because next week we'll be back with an all new monologue to work on. If you'd like to show us what you've been working on, you can send a video to us at liveconnect at bestbrains.com with your parents' permission, of course. And we might even feature it in a later video. From all of us here at Best Brains, we want to thank you for tuning in. Remember, you can hit the subscribe button below and you'll get notified when we have new videos up for you. I've been Eleanor and we'll see you next week.